that's you know, say two nine oh 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 one. They reach a fraction and die in more than one steps. And this sequence is 12, 14, 15, 20. What are these numbers? And then there are the numbers that are apparently immortal. So 270 is the first one. 290 is another, but they merge after a while. The blue ones are, seem to be distinct. Here's a, a picture from Sean Irvine showing some of the different trajectories. It, from his work, it looks, and we know, of at least nine distinct trajectories, distinct as far as he's been able to compute them. So 270 is the first. Starts here, keeps going. Other ones merge with it. Others seem to be distinct. But it's possible that they merge later on, um, or it's possible they die after a while. We don't know. Here's the trajectory of 270. It starts out 270, 396, and so on. After he, he has pushed many of these to more than 500 terms. After 515 terms, we have a 142-digit number, and it's still growing. Here's a picture of the ratios. The uh, red line is the ratio of successive terms. And you can see it's kind of around two. They're kind of doubling. On the other hand, it could die. And the, the blue squares are the powers of two. This, this is really striking. The um, scale here is, this, this is 20. So these numbers are divisible by two to the 20. So we have very high powers of two. If we get an, um, if we get an odd number, we're in trouble. We don't necessarily die after an odd number, but um, it's worrying. Even numbers are much nicer. So we, the trajectory somehow manages to keep building up powers of two. So each iteration needs you need to factorize large integers? Yes. Well, you, yes. Yeah. you have to compute sigma and n. Uh, so that's very computationally connected? Yes. Yes. So, but he he ran 500 terms. So maybe in his case, it's not typical. You have some nice small points showing up a lot. No, I don't think so. Um, as far as I know, apart from the powers of two, they're kind of random. I don't know. It would be nice to know. What's the this, this map where we send n? to the sigma of n plus e of n over 2. You can easily work out the standard things about the average order of this function. But it, it's not really applicable here, because these are really actually not random, of course, these trajectories. But I spent quite a bit of time trying to figure out what was special about 270. How did 270 know that it was the first one, it was the chosen number, that from then on it would never reach a fraction or a prime. How did it know? What was special about 270? How did it know it was immortal? And well, I thought about this, and it's, the answer is, there's nothing special about it. We actually have infinitely many of these, and this just happened to be to uh, luck I, out. I have an obvious given. In Hebrew, gematia, numerology, is ra, that's prime. It means bad. So it spells bad. The numerical value of the Hebrew word for bad, B A D, huh, is exactly 270. Ah. <laughs> uh -huh. But are there infinitely many examples? <laughs> <laughs> so the reason, I, at the next slide will explain this. Um, there are infinitely many, almost certainly infinitely many, of these numbers, and it, this is just luck. It happens to be the first one. It's the smallest, the smallest of them. And so, um, so Andrew Booker at uh, uh, Bristol, he, he, not, he doesn't have a proof, but it's a heuristic, a convincing heuristic argument that almost all numbers 
under this map are immortal. Don't die. So his argument says, look at it. Let's walk along a trajectory. Say we've got three successive terms, R, S, and T, and let's look at S. So it's the result of applying our map to a number R. And, well, there are, after S, we hope to go to T, but we could get, to get a fraction, we die, we could get a prime, which would be a fixed point, or it could be a, a, a composite number, which means we live one more day. So we go on. So his analysis goes like this. If, if S was even, we don't really need to worry about it, because if you've got an even number, the next f of s is going to be an integer, unless you were unlucky that s was twice the square or four times the square. But that's 1 over root n. That's very unlikely. So we can forget about it. All right? The dangerous things that we have to worry about is, are the odd numbers. So that means that the previous number r led us to an odd number. So that meant that sigma of r plus phi of r is a singly, a singly odd number. It's twice an odd number. So he says that these are rare. And there's an argument which um, goes like this. If r is one of those numbers, then that means you can write it as a prime times either a square or twice a square. Easy to check. We're looking at numbers which have the property that sigma of r plus phi of r um, is singly even. So it's twice an odd number. Easy to check then. So, uh, it implies, it's not equivalent to, but it implies that, that it's a prime times a square or twice a square. And now you, you say, how many of those are there up to x? And he uses a very powerful weapon, the Selberg upper bound sieve, not in its standard form, but um, there he cites Uh, Pracha prints off a title, um, and well, there's a theorem there that says when you apply it, the chance, the, the number of numbers are less than or equal to x, which have this property, is x over log x squared. Which is, so, so if you pick a, if, if r is a big number, the chance that it was one of these bad numbers was 1 over log x squared. Now you go one more step. That would, so the chance of, of being a dangerous number um, when we got to that step was 1 over log x squared. When we go one more step, um, the sequence is essentially doubling each time. So we're summing the probability. Um, e e we're tossing a coin. Each time we've got a chance of 1 over log x squared, of, of, being of being bad, but because some of one of the k squared converges, this is very unlikely. So, from, so the conclusion is a, 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 a typical large composite term, term has a zero chance of ever reaching a prime or a fraction. So it's, it's a convincing heuristic argument that most, most numbers have a, a, a trajectory which is infinite. So the answer is 270 just happened to be the first one. All right, I have one more important one. So the, the uh, problem F. The map I'm now looking at is the map that sends, it's a map on the integers. 8 gets mapped to 23 because 8 is 2 to the power 3. So 8 goes to 23. 9 is 3 squared. So 9 goes to 32. 25 goes to 52. 52, which is 4 times 13, 
2 squared times 13 goes to 2213, which is a prime. And it stops. So here's the definition. You write n as a product p1 to the e1, p2 to the e2 primes to the various exponents. If the exponent is 1, you forget it. And then the f of n, the map, it has decimal expansion, p1, e1, p2, e2, p3, e3, except you omit any ei's. So for an example, look at the number 9464. That happens to be 2 cubed times 7 times 13 squared. That gets mapped to 2, 3, 7, 13, 2. 2, 3, 7, 1. It's a decimal number. That's f of n. So that's the sequence A, 80670, an old sequence. Um, Conway, in 2014, at the conference for the 50th, in, the, in DIMAX, for the 50th anniversary of the OEIS, um, uh, there was a, a problem session. And he offered $1,000 for the solution to any, to any one of five problems. And one of them was what happens when you iterate this function. Start with n. Apply f of n over and over again. What happens? He offered $1,000 to anyone who could prove or disprove that eventually um, you reach 1 or a prime, or you don't. And the other day, June 5th, um, James Davis found a counterexample. So his number is, he said, look, let, just consider the number, 1353, 2385396179. Consider that number. Factorize it. Apply the map to it. Well, the factorization is 13 times 53 squared times 3853 times 96179. Hmm. That's our starting value. So this is a fixed, it's not a prime, obviously. This is its prime decomposition. It's a number which is fixed under this map. Thousand dollars. Very nice. <laughs> Magic. But how did he find it? Well, here's what he did. He said, let's look for a fixed point. And I want to find something we can handle. So let's look for a fixed point which is a product of some number x we don't know times a big prime p that we don't know. So x, sorry, n. n is going to be x times p. So we apply the map. We look at the factorization of x times p. It's got all the factors of x and then p. So the decimal expansion is f of x shifted and then p itself. p appeared to the 1 to the power 1. So f of n is f of x times, say, 10 to the y. y is the length of the prime. We've got all the factors in x followed by p. That's the definition of it. So, it, and that's equal to x times p. So solve for p. P is f of x over x minus 1 times 10 to some power. Y, 10 to the power. Y, y is the length of P. We don't, know, we don't know X, we don't know Y, we don't know P. All right, well, let's guess that X, let's try X is N times 10 to the Y plus 1. Well, if you plug that in, you get the equation of F of X over M is equal to P. P is a prime. And now you crank up your computer. And two seconds later, you find that n equals 1407 and y equals 5 works. It gives you a solution. The prime is 96179. x is that, which factorizes into that. And so the number is that, and that's Davis's number. Can you um, do it in other bases? Well, yes, thank you for asking. Yes, let's do it in base 2. So in base 2, the binary version. So, 9. Let's look at what 9 would go to. 9 is working in base 2. 9 is 3 squared. 3 to the power 2. So that gets mapped to 1110, which is 14 in base 10. So 9 gets mapped to 14 out of this map. So now, you get um, a fixed point for Haley Easy. David Steele uh, found that the number 255987 is fixed. It's so obviously um, not a prime. It's 3 cubed times 19 times 499. You write the factorization binary. 3 cubed 
is 1, 1 to the 1, 1. 19 is 16 plus 3, it's 1, 0, 0, 1, 1. And 499 is 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1. And that is the binary expansion of 2, 5, 5, 9, 8, 7. So that's fixed. As far as I know, that's the only fixed point that's known. But there are also two loops, length 2. And so various of the sequence fans people worked on this. And uh, Chang Hua Wu and um, David Seal and also Sharon Avai all, all worked on this. And it looked like at first the 234 was going to blow up. Um, but no, after 104 steps, Sean found that it reaches that, which is a prime, of course, so it stops. So, as far as we know at the moment, all numbers less than 1, 2, 3, 8, 9 uh, reach a fixed point, which could be a prime, or it could be this number, or they go into one of these two loops. There we have no examples. So, I'll skip that. But I will mention powertrains. So, this is an old. Uh, I forget what it was. A few years, 2007. John Conway asked me about this. He said, "Have you ever considered the number 2592? If you write 2592 down and convert, map it to two to the fifth times nine squared, that's 2592. This is well-known to group theorists. It's the order of a well-known group. So that's the map. If n has decimal expansion a b c d e, you map it." to a to the b, c to the d, e to the f, and so on. And you say that 0 to the 0 is 1. And if it's an odd number, you just, an odd number of digits, you just drop the last digit. So if you, so, so John asked me, uh, is there any other fixed point besides 2592? So I found one, which was this number, which is, um, which is not fixed, because there is, if you, if you write 2 to the 4th, 5 to the 4th, and so on, you get that number. So but th that, these are the only fixed points that we know. And it may be that there are no others. And it may be that for all of these problems, there are only finitely many exceptional points. So uh, to end up, um, if you like this kind of stuff, please, we need more editors. You can join the sequence fans and the list or so on. So I, I, I'm done. So for other bases, uh, is it also a uh, work C four, five, six, seven, eight? For the previous problem with it. I forget. Yeah. Roughly speaking, yes, it's similar. Yeah. I forget the details. We need a lot of other sequences since the summer. Thanks for being here. Of course, we'll be getting lines off.